Well, I hope we all meant that last line especially, but all of it was good. Lord, I want to be like Jesus in my heart. You see, Jesus heard us when we sung that. And he's going to take us at our word. Are we really serious about being like Jesus in our heart or following the culture that we live in? At this time, I'm going to ask Jonathan to read our text for us. You can follow along in Mark chapter 6, 14 through 29. Mark chapter 6, beginning at verse 14. And King Herod heard of him, for his name was spread abroad. And he said that John the Baptist was risen from the dead, therefore mighty works to show forth themselves in him. Others said that it is Elijah, and others said that it is a prophet, or as one of the prophets. But when Herod heard thereof, he said, It is John whom I beheaded. He is risen from the dead. For Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold upon John, and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. For John had said unto Herod, It is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Therefore Herodias had a quarrel against him, and would have killed him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man and a holy and observed him, and when he heard him, he did many things, and heard him gladly. And when a convenient day was come, that Herod on his birthday made a supper to his lords, high captains, and chief estates of Galilee, and the daughter of the said Herodias came in and danced, and pleased Herod and them that sat with him, the king said to the damsel, Ask of me whatever thou wilt, and I will give it thee. And he sware unto her, Whatsoever thou shalt ask of me, I will give it to thee, even unto the half of my kingdom. And she went forth and said unto her mother, What shall I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came in straightway with haste unto the king, and asked, saying, I will that thou give me by and by in a charger the head of John the Baptist. And the king was exceeding sorry. Yet for his oath's sake, and for their sakes which sat with him, he would not reject her. And immediately the king sent an executioner, and commanded his head to be brought. And he went and beheaded him in the prison, and brought his head in a charger, and gave it to the damsel, and the damsel gave it to her mother. And when his disciples heard of it, they came and took up his corpse, and laid it in a tomb. Well, we're talking about a birthday that went bad. I mean, really bad. A birthday is usually a joyous occasion. And I'm sure in part it was for a while. But then this happened. She's often called Salome, whether we know that's her real name or not. The daughter of Herodias was at the party and dance, a rather sensuous dance, as we know for Herod, his nobles, and those there with him. He was so pleased, he said, ask for anything, even up to half of my kingdom. Now, usually when that expression was made during then, it didn't mean literally I'd give you half of my kingdom, but in all likelihood meant I'll give you an awful lot. Well, he didn't expect her answer because she ran up to her mom immediately. She said, what should I ask for? She said he'd give me up to half of his kingdom. As for the head of John the Baptist in a platter. So she rushed back, crashed the party, and said, I want the head of John the Baptist in a platter, and I want it now. So he looked around. It grieved him. He was sorrowful, but he had all his nobles there and important people. No doubt they all looked at him. He felt trapped, 
didn't want to do it, but he gave the word. And John the Baptist was executed that time. I'm sure that put a damper on the party. At least for him it did, for sure. So you might say a birthday gone bad really is a study in the depravity of the human heart. The heart is deceitful above all things, the scripture tells us, and desperately wicked. Just watch TV, look at our culture, our society, and this demonstrated before you daily. In the joyous event of a birthday, we observe the dark side of our human nature, our sinful nature, without Christ. But there is hope. Because the scripture tells us if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. They're a new creature. The old has gone, the new has come. So we'd, look at a, we'd like to look at a number of themes. First of all, a text that's not in the book of Mark, but rather in Luke. If you turn there for a moment. In Luke 7, 18 through 23. Excuse me, John was already in prison. But John began to have doubts. Now just think about this. John that announced the Messiah, relative of Jesus, all excited about his coming. John who baptized Jesus. But when he was in prison, didn't know if he was going to be executed at that time, but when he was in prison, he started having these last-minute doubts about Christ. Boy, I'll tell you, at the end of your life, you think, boy, I want to be sure about what I believe, who I'm trusting in. But John sent a couple of his disciples, apparently in prison. He did have communication with his disciples somehow, and he knew what was going on in the ministry of Jesus. But he sent back a couple of his disciples with this question. Are you the coming one, or is there another that we should look for. Think about it. The last of his life, and now he's asking such a question. He pointed people to Jesus. And now in prison, he said, are you the coming one? Or do we look for another? Wow. Well, finally, his disciples reached Jesus. And Jesus said, go back, tell John what you've heard and seen. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended in me. Dear friends, you might call this momentary doubts. And perhaps you've experienced momentary doubts yourself. Uh, certainly the disciples after his resurrection, right, doubted that he was really alive when the woman told them. The famous Doubting Thomas, right? He said, I won't believe unless I see and touch. Even in the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 17, when he was about to send into heaven, it says, they worshipped him, but yet some doubted. Can you imagine that? When I think about this experience that John had, this momentary doubt, I think of this saying, and pay close attention to to the same. We should never doubt in the darkness what God has taught us in the light. We should never doubt in the darkness what God has taught us in the light. To translate it, we'd say this, we should never doubt when things are difficult for us what God has taught us when things were going well, when things were great. You know how sure we are when we're blessed, things are going well, it's wonderful, right? And we hang on to these truths of God in the Bible, praise God for his word, his truths, his comfort. That's in the light, things are going well. But you know what? Those same promises haven't changed in the darkness of our life. Those same promises are still there. We don't give them up when the dark time comes. So we should never doubt in the darkness what God has taught us in the light. And I believe John the Baptist 
learned that lesson because he was reassured once again of his relationship with Christ, who Christ was, and he was ready to meet his maker, and he soon did, apparently. But when I look at this story, I see a story of malice. Now, malice, by definition, is the intention or desire to do evil, ill will. And you might say Herodias, the illegal, unlawful wife of Herod, had great malice, ill will, desire to do harm against John. Well, why is that? Because John kept on saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Therefore Herodias held it against him and wanted to kill him, but she couldn't, at least not at that time. Wow, how amazing is that? You know, I remember when Stephen was preaching. Stephen was the first martyr of the Christian church in Acts chapter 7. When he was preaching, his preaching was so powerful that they blocked their ears and they came against him with one accord. They could not stand it. They certainly had malice against Stephen. They had ill will and a desire to do evil, and they stoned him to death. Hmm. Dear friend, Herodias had the same malice. She wanted to kill this Baptist because he kept saying what she was doing was against the word of God. It was illegal. And instead of recognizing the truth, she just wanted to get rid of the messenger. Wow. When you think about that. You see, for us as believers, we handle it differently. At least we should. We have goodwill towards others, even those who may not like us. We have a forgiving heart. We repay no one evil for evil. We don't avenge ourselves, and boy, did she want to avenge herself. But we give place to the wrath of God. God will handle it. I'll give it to him. He'll take care of it. Matter of fact, it says, if your enemy's thirsty, give him a drink. If he's hungry, feed him. What a different approach. So you might see at this wonderful birthday that was taking place, some ill will to do harm came into it and really ruined the whole party. We see here a broader theme. We see that the saints of God are hated. That's right. You know, in 1 John 3, 11 through 13, John says, For this is the message you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. Why did he murder his brother? Why did Cain kill Abel? Because his works were evil and his brother's righteous. You see, she saw that his works were righteous and hers were evil when he shared the word of God. She didn't like what she saw. So John says, do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. Dear friends, if you take a stand on the word of God, a righteous stand, thus saith the Lord, this is what the word of God says, and you lovingly share it with others, there's a good chance of you being hated, disliked, being called bigoted and narrow. You know, I like to say I'm as broad-minded as Jesus is, and I'm as narrow-minded as he is. I'll stick with Jesus. You take the culture. See, I can't go wrong because Jesus is God. And we see the hatred that this woman had, and apparently her daughter, for John the Baptist, because in Mark 6, 25, she immediately she came with haste to the king. 
after she went up to her mom and said, what do you request? And she said, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. I mean, talk about being gross. Here you are having a birthday party, all kinds of good foods and merriment and everything. And then this gal comes in, this young, beautiful gal comes in who just did a sensuous dance, which entertained everyone. And then she says, I want the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Wow. You, you can see the hatred there. You see, I think Herodias deep down inside knew she was wrong. And John was right. You know, the Apostle Paul said to the church at Galatia, Have I become your enemy by telling you the truth? And how sad it is in that culture, even in this culture, you become the enemy of people when you tell them the truth according to God's word. Isn't that sad? So we have to then make a decision what we're going to believe. Telling the people, telling people the truth is often upsetting. Sometimes they react. And when God's people speak the truth of God's word today, they are often hated. In some countries of the world, yes, they're beheaded and put to death for that. How should we respond? Matthew 5, 43 and 44 tells us what our response should be. It tells us very clearly here, we're not to respond as they respond, but respond with the love of Christ. It says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Wow! What an incredible and different response. Boy, I'll tell you, Herodias didn't have that response. Salome didn't have that response. She just wanted to get back. There, were a lot, there was lots of evil activity taking place there, right? What do we mean by evil activity? Activity contrary to the holiness of a righteous God. An example of evil activity could be found in the days of Micah. In Micah 2.1, it says this, Woe to those who devise iniquity and work out evil on their beds. Even on their bed, they're thinking about how they're going to hurt someone, how they're going to do evil. At morning light, they practice it because the power is in their hand. And boy, I'll tell you, when she said, I want, to get, I want you to give me the head of John the Baptist on a platter, you can tell. Herodias had been thinking about this for a long time. Remember in Jonathan's reading, she wanted to put him to death, but she couldn't. And this turned out to be a strategic time where she could put in her request. And seemingly, he couldn't refuse. See, those who devise evil in their hearts when they have opportunity, will often carry it out in practice. You keep thinking about evil long enough, you'll eventually carry it out in some way, in some form. How amazing. But not only that, in the story I see evil choices taking place. Evil choices. And I remember when I think of good and evil choices, I remember the story of Joshua. In Joshua 24, remember when he said, Choose you this day who you will serve. As for me and my house, my family, we will serve the Lord. Now you can serve the gods of the Amorites in the land in whom you dwell. That's your decision. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Well, thank God they made a good response. Verse 16 of chapter 24 of Joshua. So the people answered and said, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord and serve other gods. 
we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. You know, we have to make the same decision today. Am I going to serve the gods of this culture, the desires of this culture, where this culture is going, and boy, is going down quick? Or am I going to serve the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Am I going to serve the God of the New Testament, the same God of the Old? But now his son has come down to us, Jesus, became an atonement for us, laid down his life for us. Every day we have to make a choice. The gods of this culture, which are sin and selfishness and self-centeredness, and depravity, just as depraved as putting a man's head on a platter. I mean, what did she do with that head? When her daughter brought it up to him, what did she do with it? Did she talk to it? Did she cut it up? What did she do with it? You know, till this day, John the Baptist's head has never been found. But it shows you the depravity of the human heart, where we can hate so much we can do things like, for instance, in New York City, just declared, even after a baby is born, full-grown baby, out of the womb, we can kill it. Just as gross. It's amazing. You see, it was hard for John because she said, I want it now. Excuse me, for Herod, maybe if she said, later on, I want you to give it to me, he could have put it off. But she said, I want it now. She and her mother made an evil choice that was born from hatred. When there is hatred in our heart, we make evil choices. And boy, we see this as an example of that kind of heart. But then another character in the story, and we've mentioned him, but Herod himself, he didn't want to do it. As a matter of fact, Herod had a guilty conscience, because after he had done this, after he had done this, he thought that John the Baptist had risen from the dead. You know who else had a guilty conscience? Joseph's brothers. Remember Joseph in the Old Testament? They threw him in the well. They first they wanted to kill him, then they changed their mind, threw him in this well, dry well. Then they ended up selling him to an Ishmael, Ishmaelite caravan going to Egypt, never to see their brother again for many, many years. And they told their father a lie. They got his garment and dipped it in blood of an animal. And they say, yes, a wild animal has killed Joseph. And they knew it. But you know, as they were going back and forth, not knowing who Joseph was in Egypt, here's what they said, and listen to this guilt. Then they said to one another, we are truly guilty concerning our brother, for we saw the anguish of his soul when he pleaded with us, but we would not hear. Therefore, this distress has come upon us. You see, what we do will haunt us for many, many years to come. And his brothers were being haunted by what they did to their brother Joseph. And so it was with Herod. He didn't want to do it. He didn't want to put him to death because he knew that John was a good and godly man. He even enjoyed listening to him at times. And maybe, who knows, Herod maybe was that close from salvation. Only God knows. But he had to do it. Hmm. Look at verse 6. When Herod heard this, he said, This is John, whom I have beheaded, that has been raised from the dead. No, it was Jesus that was going about doing miracles. He thought it was John. Look at verse 20. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just and holy man, and protected him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. Dear friends, when we do evil, that guilty conscience catches up with us. But this is also a story of revenge, as we've said, right? Herodias sought to revenge herself against Job. You know another Old Testament story of revenge? You remember Jezebel? You remember Ahab? You remember Elijah? Elijah challenged the prophets of Baal as to who is a true and living God. 
and they built an altar. And they said, you build one, you call on your God, by fire to life that altar, and then I'll do it. Remember what they did? They built an altar. They jumped around the altar. They screamed, oh, Baal, hear us. They cut themselves. They bled. They jumped around like crazy. Nothing happened. And then Elijah built an altar. He even watered it down, saturated it with water, made it hard for God, supposedly, just for their visual. And God lit it up. And people realized fully that the Lord God was the God of Israel. And then he took all of their false prophets, the false prophets of Baal, 450 of them. They belonged to Jezebel. She was over them. A wicked woman she was. And he killed all of them by the sword. 450 of them. And it says, and when Jezebel found out that Elijah had killed all of her prophets, Jezebel sent a message to Elijah saying, so let the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow at this time. And when Elijah saw this, he fled for his life. Dear friends, Jezebel wanted revenge on Elijah big time. Oh, yes. Herodias wanted revenge for what John had said. He reminded her of the truth. He quoted scripture. She couldn't stand that. So she wanted his head on a platter. Revenge is a horrible thing. And we see what happened here. But then more than revenge in this story, we see evil counsel. Have you ever got bad counsel? Have you ever got bad advice from someone? You took advice from someone, boy, and it misled you. And you said, boy, I'm never going back to that person again to ask what I should do. Well, I tell you, Herodias herself was a source, a fountain of evil counsel, a picture of depravity. But going back in time, 1841 B.C., the grandson of Ahab, King Ahaziah, he was reigning at that time. And Ahaziah had bad advice. You see, he had a mother called Athalia. And Athalia was such a wicked woman. And his mother, it says, 2 Chronicles 22, his mother advised him to do wickedly. Imagine your own mom telling you to do wickedly. And then he had counselors around him. It says, for they were his counselors after his father's death, and they counseled him to his destruction. Ultimately, their counsel led to his death, his destruction. So he had a mom advising him to do wickedly and counselors that counseled him to his destruction. So Herodias, also a mom counseled her daughter and said, I want you to ask for this. She to listen. Dear friend, what an example of evil counsel we see here. But you know, in verse 26, as we look at Herod, there's one thing that was in this story that we haven't mentioned until now. There was fear of man. Fear of what man would think, what man would say, what man would do. Matter of fact, in Proverbs 29, 25, it says, The fear of man brings a snare, brings a trap. But whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. Jeremiah is told to go out and preach the word of God. And he was afraid of people. God said to him, Do not be afraid of their faces. For I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord, Jeremiah 1, 8. Hmm. And we read in our text this morning, in Mark 6, 26, and the king was exceedingly sorry. When he heard this request from this young woman, the king was exceedingly sorry, yet because of the oaths that he had given, and the oaths in the ancient world, when you gave an oath, they were almost irreversible. But not only of that, but because of those who sat with him, 
He did not want to refuse her. Dear friends, the fear of man brings a snare. We call it peer pressure today, right? Peer pressure, we do what the crowd says because if we don't, we'll stand out. We'll be the weird ones. We won't be accepted. We won't be liked. So half-heartedly, he went through with it. He was sorry. He feared what others would say. And he fulfilled his promise to Herodias' daughter. Well, wow. Some say it was too late for Herod. I mean, what could the guy do? He had given his oath. All these people were around and so on. Reminds me a little bit of Isaac, Esau, and Jacob. Remember when Isaac was going to give his blessing? And uh, the blessing to the eldest son? Now, that was common in those days. But Jacob overheard. And his father said, look, before I give the blessing, I want you to go out in the fields. You're a hunter. Saying to Esau, go out in the fields and get me some meat and uh, have Rebecca season it as I like it. We all like savory food. I do too, hot stuff on top. And so he wanted his meal. Well, Jacob heard that. When his brother went out hunting, he got together with his mom, Rebecca, and they prepared something. Then he took his brother's clothing of the field, you know, these animal skins, and he wore them and he went into his father. And he deceived his father. His father thought, it was Esau, his son, his oldest son, he was going to give the blessing to. And he gave Jacob the blessing. And then he left with the blessing. So his, finally, his son came in with the food and brought it to the father and said to the father, let my father arise and eat the son's game and your soul may bless me. And his father says, who are you? He said, I'm your son, your firstborn, Esau. Then Isaac trembled exceedingly and said, Who? Where is the one who hunted game and brought it to me? I ate all of it before you came, and I blessed him. And indeed, he shall be blessed. When Esau heard these words of his father, he cried with an exceeding great and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me also, O my father. And he said, Your brother came by deceit and has taken away your blessing. Well, you see, I guess it was too late for Esau. The blessing had been given. And yet you wonder, it was too late for maybe John the Baptist, excuse me, Herod, because he made a note, which was almost irreversible in those days. The people were watching him to see if he'd keep his word, and she wanted the request, not in the afternoon or the next day, she wanted it right now. You can see there's shrewdness and wickedness in that request. But you know what, dear friends, it's never too late for Christians. When we realize we're in a situation, even with peer pressure, it's better to obey the Lord. Okay, now this is kind of a gruesome story in a way. And we have some lessons that came out of this that make us, oh, terrible. But yet we see a picture of our unredeemed hearts. We see a picture of our sin nature. And it shows us like what we're really like. But some of the truth I get out of here when I reverse some of these things would be this. We should never doubt in the darkness what God has taught us in the light. Secondly, we should have good will towards others, not ill will. We don't avenge ourselves, but we leave that to God. Thirdly, we love the righteous, not hate the righteous for what they say, but we love the righteous and hate unrighteousness. We love our enemies and do good to them. We always choose good and not evil, despite our circumstances. We strive always to have a clear conscience before God. Boy, isn't it beautiful to have a clear conscience? Herod didn't. Herod didn't. But to have a clear conscience before God and not a guilty one. We never take revenge, even though sometimes we want to, but we bless and we pray for others. And we listen and follow only good advice. The best advice, friend, is found here in this book, the Bible. We fear God more than man. 
Herod feared man more than God. And it's never too late to do the right thing to please God. This is all possible because if anyone, if any man, if any woman, if any young person be in Christ, they're a new creature. They're a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. Dear friends, a story of depravity, but you and I in Christ walk in newness of life. We're a new creation. We're new creatures. We can walk the way of Christ, which is the way of love and goodwill and righteousness and truth, choosing good over evil time after time after time. Let us pray. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth of it. And Lord, thank you even from a birthday party gone bad, we learn lessons for our life that shows us what we are, what we're like without Christ, but also who we can be and what we are in Christ. And Lord, we rejoice to know him this day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.